this is a little bit like what I'm uh -huh. looking for, although I'm going to go on for most of the period. I'm like, you guys are going to have to be pretty concise. I'm not get quite so expensive here. of our library's charge to promote freedom of information. And just as we have books out there that will offend every one of you, we're going to have a space here where some people may not agree with the ideas presented today. But the idea is to open up this space so that all ideas can be presented and we can all learn from each other and exchange new ideas, learn, and just grow. So I'm going to ask that if you don't agree with some of this, just be respectful as you listen and share your feedback. And if you want to learn more about the topic, we have a few books here on the cart, the shelf, whatever this is. And you can always come and ask, ask the librarians and Jeff, your speaker, for more information. So with that, I want to say welcome again to Jeb and let's learn about wild salmon being a pot of gold or not. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you want me to bring that in? Yeah, sure. I think we'll get it. Okay. Well, hi, guys. So, uh, this is what I called the uh, presentation here, and it's really about uh, this issue of a, uh, a giant mine proposal, and it's a, it's a public policy battle on, uh, on a giant resource issue. Uh, do we build something that's going to get us a bunch of copper and gold, uh, or do we uh, not do that because it's a threat to uh, this, this wild salmon resource? And there's a lot of arguments on both sides. That is my son there on that picture. There he is again. He's sleeping on the deck. I was a little worried that he was going to fall off. He was seasick. This is uh, still him sleeping. I'm just in the back of our boat. These are 32-foot boats. And there's about 1,800 of them that are fishing in this bay. It's actually a pretty nice day out. Most of the time I take pictures and it's when it's nice. Um, this is the net looking off the back of the boat and that's off the water. Um, we fish with either uh, 900 or 1200 feet in the net. We're actually fishing with 1200 feet so that's uh, about four football fields long. Really long here. Uh, and in fact it's a gill net, so a lot of you may not have any idea just what that is. So I, I brought a sample of it. This is what gill net is. And I'll kind of let you guys touch this. You can imagine this uh, hanging in the water. It's got a, a line at the bottom, which has got weights to keep it down, and then floats on the top. So it's just like a curtain. And the fish strike it, and they are, uh, they are snagged by this web. Now we've got Bob Grifford in the back. Bob, how are you? Uh -huh. So Bob, uh, Bob is also a salmon fisherman. He does a uh, different gear type. He does seining, which is a much stronger net that scoops up the fish. All right, so I uh, got a rhyme in the back. You don't shave during the season. It gets pretty, pretty uh, scrappy looking. There's my son. This is our basic task on board, is picking the fish out of the net. Um, we try to pick uh, 
Oh, last year was about 15,000 fish. And when we're done picking them, we put them in uh, this icy hold that's chilled water so they get cold to keep their quality up. And then we take them to another vessel. If you're curious, this is the inside. Boat space is very, very tight with little tiny bunks uh, and a little kind of galley. So where are we talking, guys? We're talking, uh, you can recognize the map here. We're going to go right up here in this area. This is the state of Alaska. And this is the Bristol Bay area right there. Coming in a little closer, different type of map. And you might notice this is actually an accurate map of roads. And uh, we are talking about this area right here. Actually, that's the bay that I usually fish in right there. What do you see missing from all of this, guys? There are no roads. There are no roads. Uh, the, the little town I'm in has about uh, 10, 12 miles of, of road. There is no way to get there except on a ship or a boat. Um, or, um, or an airplane. So I usually get there. And all of these communities uh, throughout western Alaska, uh, you have to get there by boat or by plane. There's no roads uh, to Anchorage. Alaska is a, a gigantic state. If you would put it on the U.S., uh, it would fill up uh, most of half of the lower 48 uh, in, in the U.S. here. So uh, <coughs> I'm going to just. Uh, Hope we got some good internet and show you a little clip. So this is uh, just a few minutes of uh, a video of the area. I'm going to just get to give some facts about Bristol Bay while well, this plays here. So uh, it's home to 25 federally recognized tribal governments. Uh, there are uh, thousands of uh, Yupik, uh, Denai, Athabascan, um, uh, Aleut, tribal, tribal people there. The Nishigak and the Quijak rivers are the two largest, and about half of the salmon are from those rivers. Those are the two that are directly impacted by this proposed mine site. 35 different types of fishes, 190 types of birds, and more than 40 mammals. You probably know some of them, right? Bears, um, ferrets, uh, caribou, uh, moose. So this is a uh, thriving, uh, fully intact ecosystem, which doesn't really exist in the lower 48 in the US anymore. And pretty much fully modified, damaged, destroyed, otherwise altered all of our ecosystems this is about 10,000 or more square miles of really pristine habitat. There is no, uh, there is no logging. Uh, to date, there, there isn't any mining. That is what is at issue. There is no development. Some of you know that we do have salmon runs down here in Seattle. And why are they so much poorer than they were 100 years ago when this, the rivers were full of fish? Well, we built dams. That's one thing we did. We also built lots of houses, cut down the trees, uh, down to the lakes and the rivers. We have agriculture all over, going over, and that runoff. And all of these things have uh, affected uh, the salmon here. But not so in Bristol Bay, where um, the salmon come up. You can see some bears eating these uh, salmon here. Um, so the run's uh, 37 and a half million fish. It's averaged uh, between 1990 and 2010. And uh, 14 of the 25 villages are in this watershed that's going to be affected by the mine. Oh, we got bears eating salmon. I just thought it occurs to me I'm not really a wildlife biologist. But if the salmon disappeared, what would the bear do? They would go find something else to eat, wouldn't they? <laughs> um, they would probably go and start eating moose. They already do that. What would happen to the moose population? They would probably eat every moose they possibly could, and the moose population would go down. So moose are a uh, subsistence item. Um, I think I read something like 80% of the protein that people eat here, they, they, they generally don't go down to Safeway or QFC uh, for their protein. They go, they get fish that they catch, uh, or moose or caribou that they hunt. Um, 
So moose are very important up there for people who live up there for eating. Uh, they certainly, without the salmon, I think the moose would be uh, in peril also. So let me uh, click out of this, get back to our presentation here. And what do we got next? Okay, so it's all about the fish. There's my kid, he's now 16 uh, on the boat, uh, having it up with the fish here. So this is, uh, he was actually holding a king, uh, but the sockeye salmon are really the, the primary uh, component of this, of this salmon run. And you saw pictures of them in that video. They were red. They change color from silver to red when they get into the rivers. They're silver out in the ocean when we catch them. They get into the fresh water. Uh, they turn bright red, bright green head here. And you can see that this chart's kind of interesting. It's got <clears throat> the entire global run of sockeye. Japan's got a few. Russia's got a pretty sizable sockeye run. Uh, Canada's got some. Fraser, you can see it varies a lot year by year. Uh, other Alaska, and Bristol Bay here, you can see kind of averages uh, close to 50%, maybe a little less, of all of the sockeye uh, on the planet coming in uh, to this, uh, to, to Bristol Bay. Uh, that's why we catch them here. <clears throat> this graph is the harvests, that's the red bars, and then the value. So again, you can see a lot of variability uh, got pretty low. This is where they instituted limited entry right here. They fixed the number of boats that could fish, the number of permits, they limited the length of gear, and they manage it on an escapement system. Hey, Greg. So um, they don't let us go out and put our nets in the water until so many fish have run up the river. And they, they literally count the fish that are going up to spawn. Uh, and they have charts. They've been doing this now for 40 years. And they actually do it pretty well. You can see the value changes quite a bit. It depends on the salmon market at the time. Uh, this is uh, 2013. You can see we catch a uh, statewide harvest here is about 30 million sockeye salmon. Uh, and the value up there is about $275 million. And that's just what the fishermen are collecting $275 million, all of those fishermen combined. There's obviously a lot more money that's going in there, right? Because all of you this summer could go up to, an Alaska, go up to Alaska and do what? Process the fish, get jobs uh, in the industry. So there's uh, somewhere between 12 and 14,000 jobs total uh, of people who are working, catching these fish, cutting them up, freezing them, Setting them down, of course, and they have more value down here. When you go to some of our restaurants in town, you're going to be eating salmon, eating all over the uh, planet here. 30 million fish. You make about 60 million of these. This is a, a filet, sockeye filet. Doesn't it look delicious? <laughs> yeah. Family of four would have a hard time finishing this. So salmon's really uh, have a lot of substance to it, fills it up. So I think that uh, every every man, woman, and child could could uh, get filled up on uh, sockeye salmon with what's uh, produced in, uh, in Bristol Bay. There. Well, keep going. This is what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. We're eating these fish. They're beautiful, they're a miracle, they're amazing, but they're delicious also. So, what is pebble? What does pebble have to do with this? So, it is the largest proposed copper and gold and molybdenum, molybdenum, uh, that's three metals, the primary mineral resources in this proposed site uh, in North America. And you can see <coughs> here, this is the area of the larger map. So we've just gone into this area here. Here's the tip of the ocean of bay. This is where we're fishing. There's a couple more rivers south here. And right here is the actual footprint of the proposed mine. They have not actually started digging this mine yet. They need to get 
permission to do that. And that's kind of the heart of what I want to talk about is this uh, intensely political process of uh, doing a massive excavation. Uh, what most reasonable people contend is a great risk to the environment for a huge amount of money. Um, Got to just add, besides these giant pits that are going to get dug, and I'll try to help you understand how big those are a little bit, they've also got to build an entire power plant um, to generate a huge amount of electricity to power all of this equipment. Uh, they need to have housing for about 2,000 workers during the construction phase. Uh, notice there's no roads, guys. So all of this has to get trucked in or barged in. They propose building a road. And along that is a giant pipeline, 18-inch pipeline to pipe uh, slurry out uh, to ships that will catch it in, oops, catch it in uh, Cook Inlet and then take it out uh, 35 billion gallons of water. Hard to imagine 35 billion gallons. I don't have a good uh, comparison for you. But all of that water has <coughs> got to get sucked out of uh, this environment, which is certainly going to have some consequences for the fish that live here. Uh, this is an example of an open pit mine. You can go visit this one. <clears throat> this is Kennecott's Bingham Canyon mine in Utah. It is uh, one of the largest holes in the world. It's 4,000 feet deep. You can kind of get a sense of the scale by seeing the size of the giant vehicles that are down there enormous dump trucks. Uh, this is a, a little evocative of what uh, would be happening in Bristol Bay. Here's some numbers, guys. They've, you, you dig all this rock out of the ground, and then you've got to do something with it. And basically, you've got to build giant dams to hold back this rock. Uh, the largest is 740 feet tall of these earthen dams. The Space Needle is 605 feet tall. So if you can imagine standing 140 feet above the Space Needle, that would be the perspective you would have on top of one of these dams. You probably all stood at the base of the Space Needle and thought, that is a very high thing here. About 1,500 feet deep, 15 square miles, <clears throat> and 10.78 billion tons of toxic waste. That's a little qualifying it. It is, it is rock that is acidic for mining. Um, it certainly could be toxic, certainly to salmon uh, in the area. That's a lot of waste, guys. That's about a ton and a half, something like that, for every man, woman, and child on the, on the planet. You have your own ton of toxic waste. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a comparison here, guys. So <clears throat> this is about how deep the mine's going to be about 450 meters, so uh, the Twin Towers, which obviously no longer exist, uh, could uh, would, would fit in there. You would just see the tops of them. That's how big that is. Uh, Empire State Building, of course, is still there. I've never seen the Petronas Towers. Who's seen those? Anybody in this room? Yes. In your place, in your land. Uh, Pagley Tower, who's seen that? Okay. I work there. You work there. It's pretty damn tall, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing, I thought. <clears throat> and the, <coughs> excuse me, the earthen dams guys would be about, about this tall, about 225 meters. That's how tall the dams would be. So <clears throat> this is the uh, proposed kind of footprint of where it would be, and you can probably tell, guys, this is superimposed on Seattle. Here's Mercer Island, and where are we, guys? We're right, uh, we're right about here, aren't we? Somewhere. That's where Capitol Hill is. So this is down uh, in uh, Burien, below the airport down there, uh, stretching all the way up to, uh, to shoreline. <clears throat> on I-5, what does that take? About 25 minutes on driving straight. That's how big of an excavation it is. This is one of the principal things that uh, they're after, is uh, gold. Uh, we use gold uh, in your teeth. Gold jewelry, but really principally gold is what? It is a, a vessel for wealth. Um, if you 
follow any financial stuff right, when stock market starts weakening and crumbling, people that have money buy gold because gold will hold that wealth. It's, it's real. So it's kind of this strange thing we can pull out of the earth and kind of capture wealth to it. Other thing is uh, copper. Uh, we use copper. I'm using copper right now, right? In my hand is copper. In this computer is copper. All the wiring in the walls is copper. Uh, maybe say, like, I don't really care that much about gold, but it's hard uh, to go about your daily life <coughs> without using a lot of copper. Pretty essential stuff. So uh, these are the prices. These are the current estimates of how much, oops, how much uh, material they're going to get out of the mine. They, they calculate they have 55 billion pounds of copper, um, 67 million ounces of gold, and 3.3 billion pounds of molybdenum. Molybdenum is a metal that uh, does not contract uh, under heat. It's used in making alloys, used in making stainless steel, car engines, things like that, metallurgy. Uh, I, very important that I put this down here. Feb, I, I looked up these prices last night because uh, gold and all metals prices drastically change from time from day to day. There are commodities uh, <clears throat> that fluctuate. So you can see here that uh, right now gold, uh, as of last night, uh, was at, uh, I think I used, I found $1,300 13, $13, <clears throat> an ounce. But uh, just back about a year, a couple of years back here, it had uh, gotten up to uh, over almost $1,900 an ounce. So it's a little hard to say just how much the mine is worth at any one point in time. You can't predict the future <clears throat> and how these metals uh, are going to shape uh, what price fluctuations can be in the metals here. I thought this would be fun. 55 billion <coughs> pounds of copper, you could make 1.76 trillion cell phones with that. Does that help you understand that number a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> could have had some other numbers, miles of wire over there. Here. Um, Gold, uh, 400 ounce, uh, this is like the gold bars in Fort Knox, or people are hoarding golds, it's a 400 ounce bar, 158,000 of those is what they estimate. Okay, you want to dig this giant hole because you can get hundreds of billions of dollars of minerals out of it. What do you do? Well, it comes down to, it comes down to this, at least in the case of the state of Alaska. Alaska Department of Natural Resources and an 11 person commission that will approve the permits. And this guy is Dan Sullivan, and he's the head of the commissioner. And if you think of the uh, extraordinary power that is put into uh, such a small group uh, of people who get to make this decision. Now, there is a higher authority over them. The federal government, which I'll talk about uh, in just a little bit. But it starts here. <clears throat> they have not approved this mine because Northern Dynasty, the mining company, has not submitted the permits yet. But they have been waiting, they have been waiting. They say we need to do more data collection. Um, I'm quite sure they realize that they are losing the political battle and this is not the right time to submit these permits. Political winds are against them, so they're waiting. They've waited a little too long. Even one of their champions, uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski of, uh, of the state of Alaska, actually uh, criticized them publicly. He said they need to hurry up and submit these permits. And she had really been a champion, more or less a supporter of, of development uh, in the area. So what do you do? You, uh, if you're if you're Nor the Northern Dynasty, you need to create a political climate favorable, so that this commission and the other authorities are going to endorse your project and give you permission. That basically means winning the hearts and minds of the population. So the Pebble Partnership is kind of the overarching organization, uh, and they have been uh, is their their website. <coughs> Uh, they, I think they put out about $20 million into the region. 
a very low population. You know, you build a library, you build a school, you start some scholarships, and you try to generate lots of goodwill, and you give people jobs. I thought this was very cleverly written, guys. What is Pebble Mine? This is Pebble's, Pebble's language here. Right now, it's an idea, an idea that could help power our nation's green energy initiatives. <laughs> Wasn't that clever? <laughs> We're not anti-salmon. We are a green company. We are trying to lift this country into the future. An idea that could bring jobs and infrastructure to Southwest Alaska, helping families remain in their villages and thrive. An idea that all of this is possible in harmony with the environment. The first blush, you read that, you go, oh, it's beautiful. Go for it. Well, let's hear what their arguments are. People move away. It threatens our villages. Rural Alaskans are leaving their communities. Lack of jobs and the high cost of living have led to shrinking populations. When villages become too small, schools close and people move away. It threatens our villages, our cultures, and our traditional ways of life. The question is, how do we create jobs and opportunities that offer stability? In Southwest Alaska, Pebble could be part of the solution. So you're, uh, you're hired by Pebble Corporation, and they are paid a good salary, and the boss says your job is to create some nice media that's going to win people over. So you go out and go, what am I going to do? I'm going to go find a beautiful native gal to be my star, my spokesman, which is exactly what they did. Martina Arce is from uh, Ileana. Uh, she's, I think, quite a presence. Um, she is an actress, guys. She's an actress, paid to do this. And uh, this is an argument that rings, uh, resonates pretty powerfully with a lot of people who actually live there. Uh, they don't actually make a great deal of income from their from their fishing. Uh, if you visited this area, you might be a little shocked uh, the quality of the houses and the roads, and uh, they, they, have, uh, they have a pretty simple existence. I guess one question is: is is wealth does wealth make you better and happier? Uh, if you don't have it, you often think you do, but uh, maybe that's not the case. So, uh, maybe we'll do one more here. I've got actually three of her ads. Southwest Alaska has one of the highest cost of living in the nation, with few economic opportunities. A gallon of milk is $9, and a gallon of gas costs nearly 6 Many residents have sold their fishing permits to afford necessities like food and fuel. Others are leaving because they can't afford them. The question is, how do we create jobs and opportunities that offer stability? In Southwest Alaska, Pebble could be part of the solution. Yeah, well, uh, hold communities together, pretty powerful moral argument to make. That's what this mine is gonna do. Um, I think I'll skip over this one, but she, mm -hmm. uh, she goes hiking and claiming that the mine is a long ways from Bristol Bay. Uh, it's quite cute. Um, it's actually really, false piece of propaganda because <laughs> the mine's going to pour in the rivers, which is all going to drain out of Bristol Bay. It's really a, a, a silly argument. But as in any good propaganda campaign, right, it's playing off of, of ignorance and misinformation among so many people. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> isn't there an arrangement in Alaska where uh, all the residents get a share of oil revenues? And has Pebble promised anything uh, similar? From its operations. Yeah, Alaska does have the, the permanent fund, and it's about a thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child annually. Um, Pebble promises to put in billions and billions into their tax generation, so I don't, uh, I don't know what they'll leave that money. Okay, <clears throat> so that's Pebble's argument. Now I'm a fisherman, and I hate. I am terrified of the idea of this mine, guys. Absolutely absolutely dread this idea of this mine being built. So my son on the boat, I've done that for 28 years. I know many people uh, who live up there, um, native people. Um, 
spent a lot of my life up there. Um, I believe in the beauty and the, the purity of this land, so I'm horrified. What do you do? Well, uh, you get together and you, you make noise. It's a good place to start. Let yourselves be known. This is actually in Dillingham. Um, and you can see the, these are very typical Dillingham folks there. Uh, you, you hold uh, teach-ins. Uh, I think this is actually an EPA hearing, but this is Peter Andrews. Um, did, we ever, did we get that movie? Yeah, it's on the, um, Oh, cool. Yeah, um, you guys can check out this movie. And Peter Andrews is a kind of a star in this movie. A really neat guy runs a boat called the Lucky Bear. Um, and what else we got here? Well, we got We can't just make noise. And we can't just uh, make emotional arguments about something as beautiful. That that just doesn't work. So let's get to some science here. We're talking about a giant, giant copper mine. Copper is a really bad thing for salmon and other aquatic life here. There's a huge body of research on it. Uh, directly damages sensory capabilities of salmonids. So the salmon look healthy, but they cannot live like they are supposed to. If you know anything about salmon, <clears throat> they return to their stream. They create uh, nests, so they lay their eggs. Uh, and all of this is uh, dreadfully thrown out of whack by the small presence of small amounts of copper uh, in the water. Uh, also, predator avoidance. So even when they're tiny, small amounts of copper, they are healthy. But what is predator avoidance? If something wants to eat you, what are you supposed to do if you're a little fish? You stay perfectly still. So you are invisible. Copper, they don't have that response, uh, and they are subject to getting eaten by all the other things that, that want to eat them. So, what else, guys? Well, this is a dam in South Africa, excuse me, a tailings dam in South Africa. Uh, this is, uh, I mentioned, the 740 foot high dam walls. There is concern that this could happen there, and these 10 billion tons of Toxic waste would spill out, uh, flooding Lake Iliamna, pouring into the watershed. Uh, it would be absolutely catastrophic. This mountain of uh, acidic and copper laced rock would go out here. This is actually uh, in Hungary. This flooded a town. It was just, just absolutely horrible uh, what happened there. <clears throat> so, uh, well, if they built dams correctly, that shouldn't happen, right? We're, we're smart. Not like these other people have made mistakes. We're smart. We're smarter than they are. Our dam isn't going to break. Well, there are things called earthquakes, right? And uh, 2002, I hope you can get an appreciation. This, this is in Denali National Park. Uh, it was a, a, a tremor that triggered this massive slide there. And this is, I don't know, 400 miles away. The significant thing kind of is that uh, this happened along a fault line that they did not know existed. So Pebble says it is designed to handle a 7.8 magnitude quake uh, 15 miles away, the closest fault. Uh, but I kind of say, how do you know for sure that there is not a fault line closer to the mine that you just haven't discovered yet? Uh, this is a very geologically active region, 1964, it's a couple weeks before I was born. This was uh, the Anchorage earthquake was the second largest ever recorded in history. 9.4 on the Richter Colossal, stunning. And about 50 years before that, one of the five largest volcanic eruptions in history, Nugarupta. This is about 80 miles away from from the proposed mine site. So it's a very, this is part of the ring of fire in the northern Pacific here. What else do you do, guys? You make posters and you get organizations together like City Bristol Bay. <coughs> Whoops. What happened? Did I just click on it? That's bad. Sorry 
about that. We're doing so well, too. Jeez. Jeez, I'm feeling so good about everything. No. Stop it. Uh, we okay. might might want to reboot. That's the next step, yeah. Sure. Um, well, I think I think I got to most of the essentials. Actually, anyway, guys, I was going to show you some uh, posters of uh, organizations that have gotten uh, heavily involved in some of the media they have done. Uh, some of you guys might know the actor Robert Redford, uh, who is uh, in a film. Uh, all is lost. I haven't seen the film yet. The very famous actor. He had full page ads. He got into the fight in the New York Times. <coughs> uh, the, I guess one point that I needed to get to, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has authority over the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. And that is our political system giving the state certain rights and in certain cases, the federal government comes in and says, we are asserting sovereignty and our rights. Uh, where has this happened in our history? Well, quite famous the guys in the civil rights struggle. The federal government said, we are going to determine the law of the land on segregation, on Jim Crow laws, came in. And the Environmental Protection Agency uh, also has that power. Uh, they actually legally have the authority to prevent the mine from ever ever starting even before it's permitted. So right now that is an intense political process uh, going on in uh, in Washington and lobbying. I think they're I think they're wiping their brows if they've missed a bullet right now they think the political winds are uh, are going against this mine. What are some great great news that has happened from my perspective guys? September, Anglo-American uh, pulled out its investment. The mine company lost half of its money. It needs $4.7 billion to build this mine. It does not have that money anymore. The investors uh, have pulled out. Tiffany's, you guys know Tiffany's? Mm -hmm. Tiffany said, and 50 other jewelers said, we will not sell any gold produced from this mine. This is dirty, dirty gold. A uh, little bit of a symbolic gesture, but, but pretty pretty powerful as well. Uh, smearing uh, the corporations doing this with you know, your reputation is going to be deeply tarnished uh, if this mine goes forward. Rio Tinto is another uh, international mining corporation uh, that's invested in it, and they are now considering pulling out. And even, uh, I saw a news article the other day, pension funds in the state of California. So if you work a public agency and you get a pension that's built up and then there's that all that money is managed and invested and even these managers of these pension funds are saying divest from Rio Tinto its its stock is going to go down because 
its reputation as being smeared with this mind. This mind's a loser. Divest from it now. Uh, so that's, um, we can make all the moral arguments we like and all the logical arguments we like, but when you start getting them in the pocketbook, that's a really good sign that you're, you're winning the yeah. fight. People lose their pocketbook. Uh, so are they, were they planning to extract the gold by uh, you know, cyanide leaching uh, and store the tailings in, in earthen dams? Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know the precise process. They were taking uh, 200,000 tons per day and grinding that into a slurry and then piping that out to ships. And then it was going to go to another processing facility. Uh, the arsenic would be at the end of that shipping procedure. Yeah. 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 yeah uh, I'm understanding the, uh, the damage to the environment and to uh, maybe Britain's uh, the fishermen's livelihood and all that. But what's the social economic realities for the people that live in that area? I yeah. Mean, I mean, not just the people that have jobs, but the actual villagers, people that don't have access to, uh, you know, employment. To jobs. I, I mean, a thousand bucks a year ain't going to get you nothing in Alaska. Yeah. No, it's not. It's I mean, what's their alternative? And that's that's one of the that's a very compelling argument they have. That jobs are really scarce, apart from the fishing industry jobs. Uh, Iliamna did vote on this, and uh, there's only about 450 people there to vote who are really affected by this. So, so and it was slightly like, against the mind. So they, they have no real political power then? They have moral political power, but they do not get to say whether this mine is built or not. So the vote's kind of a symbolic vote, political vote. Yeah. So either way, they don't necessarily stand to benefit one way or the other. I mean, just like that apart from uh, protecting uh, the, the area where they live? The, the, the people who live there? Yeah. They, they would benefit, uh, the estimate is, is uh, 50 to 60 years of, of 1,000 people employed, after which the mine would be a big hole in the ground. And no, I, I, I meant from the mine not happening. Oh, no, they don't benefit from the mine not happening. Actually, a lot of them do have jobs, and a lot of them are upset to be losing their jobs now is because they pulled funding, a lot of financial support from the initial phases here. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very compelling argument. And, uh, yeah. Or would you, even if, like, say, the mine were to go through, would they, would Pebble hire people locally or would they hire people with outside expertise? And so, like, the locals wouldn't benefit other than the you know, yeah. roads and schools and whatnot? I think they would do both. Okay. I'm, I'm certain there would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers from outside that would come in, and those locals who did want to work could. Uh, for a lot of folks uh, who live there, that's honestly, that's not even kind of part of their lifestyle, is, is an eight-hour job, five days a week. They kind of don't do that, um, that work cycle, they're subsistence livers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things about Pebble that is really disturbing is that it's very much like all kinds of other abandoned mines all over the American West and in Alaska. I've walked all over parts of Southeast Alaska and so on because I lived there for years. And there's all kinds of abandoned mines there. And with every abandoned mine, there's an abandoned town, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, this area will be abandoned, but there won't be any fish left, right? So the way I see it is there could be fish there a thousand years from now, right? Because those fish have been harvested perpetually for at least seven or 8,000 years without any decline in their numbers because there isn't any industry around there and it's never been over harvested. Exactly. So it, it, it's really a no brainer, but I think with a lot of these environmental issues, we get very short sighted. We only think about the generation that's in front of us right now. Yeah. It's, it would be about a, one or two generations who would benefit from this mine, and then, and then it would be played out. <coughs> and I do believe that the mine built, we would, it would be kind of, you guys know the Lorax story? Avatar? <laughs> Some people thought this was kind of similar. Do we have, uh, can you think of other? I mean, this has happened up in Alaska. Any other issues that are kind of close to home that are kind of similar? Coltrane. Coltrane. 
Coltrane's. That's, that is a big public policy debate going on now. I had some shots. There was a year ago a big rally, a couple thousand people down, uh, all in red shirts and red signs opposed to this. This is to move uh, millions of tons of coal from Montana <coughs> to coal ports here and then shipped to China. Um, Keystone? And Keystone. And Keystone. They had that also here. A pipeline to collect the tar sands of Alberta. Uh, pumping that oil uh, south. Um, you notice both of those have in common is also massive contributors to burning fossil fuels. And most folks realize that global warming is real and we've already really screwed things up quite a bit. I think most, most educated people. Got a couple minutes left. Anything else? Right. I'm sorry the show crashed. That was, that was bogus. Yeah. But you gotta you gotta prepare for that. Which I don't know how you prepare for that. You just have to do something else when you show this part. facilitator um, the fight for $15 in Seattle and we'll have economics faculty member and Seattle City Council member Shama Sawat is going to be in this room and before that if you want to take a little bit of break from the seriousness go and celebrate multicultural week downstairs Pedro the student who came by he wants to invite you all to multicultural week there's you can hear the music and there's food and dance and all of that going on in BE 1110. They're celebrating Latino culture. So you might want to check that out. Thank you all. See you next time.